Welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Matteson. Tonight we're looking for insights into how the ANC went astray. My guest is a rising star in Parliament. He's the Chief Whip of the United Democratic Movement, Nkwabane Nomzi Kwankwa. Welcome. Thank you very much. You're you 35 much. years old. You started life as a cleaner. You went into pri the private sector before politics. You've now completed, or more or less completed, an MA in economics. And some see you as the man that Gen General Bantu Holomisa is grooming to succeed him in the UDM. Given the history of that other regional party, the Encarta Freedom Party, where Prince Mangasuta Budelezi has hung on into old age without an obvious succession plan, it's encouraging and a sign of smart leadership, but of course, it depends on the voters in the party what really happens. Correct. My first question to you is, if General Holomisa is known for any, anything, it's his opposition to corruption. He's always shown a discipline, even his uh, adversaries would agree, he lives within his means, he's, he's been disciplined, and he gave up a position in the cabinet because of his fast, uh, steadfastness fastness in opposing corruption. Um, why do you think that is? Is the whole UDM like that? It seems hard to believe that a whole party might be committed to opposing corruption in the, common, in the current environment. Well, remember, the, it's, it's, the, it's the culture that the senior leadership of the party has inculcated in the party. Uh, to say that the fight against corruption, or if you want to put it in a more positive light, uh, fighting for a more cleaner uh, governance, you know, either in political parties or in government, is, is a value uh, that we espouse internally in the party. Obviously, in any political party, there will be challenges. There will be a few instances where you have individuals, for instance, who are corrupt, but it's how you deal with it. It's also a matter of making sure that you, you put systems in place uh, to make sure that they minimize the risk that people might be able to appropriate party funds or even public funds for private use for that matter. So it's more a leadership issue. It's more a leadership in encouraging us to make sure that we, we close the tap, we do things properly, there's efficiency in the system with the li limited resources that we get from government and IEC in particular, I should say. Well, with that background, what is your insight? Why do you think how did the ANC get this way? How did it lose its way so badly? They lost their way uh, simply because, remember when they came from, they were a liberative, uh, liberation movement, a former liberation movement that had now to, to transform itself into a democratic party that runs a country. Obviously there are certain things and certain behavioral tendencies that may, may have been entrenched in the past before. In exile? Uh, in exile, yes. And now when they came over, it's almost like the ANC assumed that most of those people who made mistakes, who had learned bad things in the past, would now all of a sudden become saints and put uh, the, the interest of the people above everything else. But obviously, it's also a question where you find that maybe some of the leaders in the party uh, are not serious about the fight against corruption. For instance, if you look at President Zuma, one cannot say it would be wrong to argue that corruption in the ANC started under his leadership. But what has made it worse is simply because he, he, he lacks the moral authority because of all the scandals that surround him. He lacks the moral authority to be able to speak against corruption. And the other issue, obviously, is where if your leader lacks that moral authority to talk about corruption, if the leader is not seen as a person who can fight corruption, then you, you, you create a culture of impunity within the system. But it didn't start with Zuma, did it? That's right. Uh, but at least back then, the situation did not get out of control because those leaders, even though they made mistakes, Man Nelson Mandela, for instance, and then former President Tabumbeke as well, they made mistakes. If you remember correctly, I think there were some factions in the ruling party who were accusing President Zuma of being factionalist in his approach to fighting corruption. He would only fight corruption against those who did not, were not part You're of You're talking about President Zuma or President, President Becky? President Becky. Pe President Becky. But when you come to President Zuma, it's, it's almost like it's a free for all. Yeah. Uh, there's a culture of impunity that is set in and that is taken root. But in the past year, those leaders, even though they made mistakes in terms of fighting corruption internally in the ANC and in government, uh, but they did have that moral authority to talk about issues of corruption. But um, you referred to President Mbeki. President Mbeki was behind the promotion of, Pres of, of Jacob Zuma. That's right. He must have worked, he'd worked so closely with him for so long. Mm -hmm. He must have known his character. Of course, yes. But I think, you see, I, I, I usually say, this is my opinion now, 
uh, sure. as a young leader. I sure. think when he made that appointment, he lacked foresight in that particular instance, because to him it was more about surrounding maybe himself with a person that he considered to be a yes man, rather than looking ahead to say, once I have left the office, this gentleman will have to take over from me because it's an established tradition of the ANC that the deputy president then becomes the president. So that means that, that uh, I mean, one of the biggest failings of the Mbeki era was not only to not plan a succession, mm -hmm. as we were discussing whether uh, your party will succeed in doing it in a more manageable way, uh, but in fact to, to prevent an orderly succession because the strong people of the political, of the ANC at the time of Mbeki were pushed aside. Well, you can say, uh, you know, the system had its strengths and weaknesses. There were certain individuals who were very strong and capable cadres, who were deployed in strategic positions, who were able to make a valuable contribution to building the country. But there were, some, there were also some uh, dubious appointments uh, that were made, which took us a, you know, a couple of steps backwards. That included, obviously, the making sure that President Mbeki, President Zuma, rather, became the deputy president at the time because it was more, he became more a ceremonial deputy president because President Becky at the time wanted to centralize power around his office. You think he, did, he didn't expect uh, Zuma to, to take over? He thought a man without education could never be president? No, no, no. President Zuma is a shrewd politician. He's a serious political animal. He can never be underestimated. Uh, at but do you think Becky underestimated him? He did. He certainly did. Yes. Yeah. Um, by comparison, you know, I was at the uh, event where the United Democratic Front closed down, and that was an internal national organization uh, which closed down voluntarily because they didn't want to be in competition with the ANC. Yes. But they seemed to have a better democratic culture and a better sense of accountability than, 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 than perhaps uh, President Mbeki and the people around him had. Mm -hmm. I think the problem, it, it comes from exile and how the ANC conducted itself or was forced by circumstances to conduct its, its affairs. Remember, everything it did at the time was, uh, was shrouded in secrecy. Sure. Primarily because and great they were risk. Banned. Yes, yes. Primarily because they were banned at the time. That forced leaders to make decisions without consulting at times proper structures. Sure. Or you were not, sure. they were not able to consult as widely as they may have wanted at the time. Yes. But I think that created a culture where people think they can do as they please, even in the country and when they are running the country, or they can deploy cadres without accounting to anyone about what happens or whether or not those institutions are going to be effective. That, that's, that, that's, that's, that's the tragedy we were living with. And, and as you say, there were sort of understandable reasons. We're, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the local elections and what's going to happen in Nelson Mandela Bay. Welcome back. We're talking about the political situation and particularly we, I wanted to ask you because you're, uh, you're so entrenched in the Eastern Cape, but you're a small party. What do you expect will happen in Nelson, Bay, in Nelson Mandela Bay in the elections, which are only eight weeks away? There will certainly, it's our view that there will be no outright uh, uh, majority winner, winner yes, uh, at, at the Nelson Mandela Metro. Primarily because of the challenges that the ANC is facing, the, its internal revolt. But we've seen a situation over the years where people have actually started moving to other politi political parties and opposition parties in particular. But I think what needs to happen now is that as, as opposition parties, we need to strategize as to how we, what kind of coalition government would form and then start campaigning around a number of issues that we think would speak directly to that constituency but at the same time not contradict each other. I've, I've, I've been saying, even in Parliament, that it's counterproductive for us as sister opposition parties, parties to be fighting about issues in Parliament when we should be working together, complementing each other more on certain issues uh, to make sure that we're able to put the ANC under pressure and in, that, in the instance of the National Mandela Metro, make sure that we turn them into an opposition government after the elections in, 20, uh, in August. But uh, so you, do you see uh, the DA and the ANC each getting something like 40%, some, somewhere in that sort of yes. range? <clears throat> yes, and then the, most of the kingmakers would more or less be uh, found between the smaller parties and the economic freedom fighters, obviously. And, and, and we are working very hard to make sure that we become actually a kingmaker 
yeah. in that municipality. Do you think, uh, uh, I mean, that implies that a lot of uh, people in the Eastern Cape, Cape will vote for a white leader, for a white mayor uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the DA leadership? Well, there's nothing wrong. If, for instance, um, I think uh, Comrade Trollip, without, without campaigning on his behalf or selling him to the South African people, uh, I think is a competent uh, politician, competent leader who's proven himself over the years. If he becomes the mayor and is able to deliver services to the people, so be it. But obviously, when we have a coalition government, I'm sure he'll be surrounded by other competent leaders from various political parties who will help him to s deliver services to the constituency. And uh, we, we recently had a report that showed quite, uh, high levels of non-delivery in, in uh, Nelson Mandela. Do you think that can be turned around? It can be turned around. Remember the first thing that uh, I remember, we, we usually talk in, in our corridors as opposition parties and say it's better uh, to sit in, in opposition rather than to govern. Uh, get an opportunity to govern and do so badly, yeah. uh, because then the electorate will never forgive you. Uh, so we know that we're under pressure in instances where we manage to win municipalities, we have a point to prove. We, a, we have to prove to them that we can do it better than the ANC, so that ultimately we can, say in 2019, be able to take over the province from the ANC. What, what are the restrictions on uh, uh, or what kind of coalitions the UDM would go into? Would you, would you go into co co uh, coalition with the EFF and or the ANC? Uh, it would, I'm sure the, our first point of call would obviously be with uh, among the sister opposition parties, right? And if that fails, you might end up considering the African National Congress because it's usually co coalitions um, are determined by the issues on the table that you discuss oh. as political parties, in essence. What about the rest of the country? Uh, do, you see, uh, do, you, do you see the ANC losing a lot of ground? I mean, do you think it'll lose any other metros? Uh, if, if you look at the, the performance of the economic freedom fighters, say the metro like um, Pretoria and Johannesburg, yeah. uh, even though they might not lose some of those metros, but I think they are going to be given a serious run for their money. But in other rural municipalities where, for instance, the economic freedom fighters or the United Democratic Movement is strong, far strong, there's a great likelihood that the ANC might lose those municipalities. Like, for instance, the King Sabata Dalinjebo municipality in the Eastern Cape, which we used to, to govern in the past. Uh, as the ANC? No, 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 oh, as the, the UDM, UDM. Yeah. as the UDM. Yes, there are clear signs, you know, there are some indications that people are disgruntled with the non-service delivery record of the ANC and that they would like to give us a chance uh, to see whether or not we can improve on that. So you're suggesting that several metros could be lost by the ANC? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, and, and, and what is your sense of the EFF? I mean, you know, the, uh, Julius Malema as leader sometimes talks a brilliant constitutional uh, uh, argument mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, it looks a lot more like coercion. Where do you think his heart is uh, uh, or do you think it's just opportunism? Well, I think... Um I think the problem sometimes, you know, uh, is uh, the crisis is created by the ANC itself. Where on the one hand, they allow their president to violate the constitution and that it's fine after that, everything can go on, it can be business as usual. And then expect the other people, for instance, even though we're living in a constitutional crisis, uh, to, to, to behave as if things are hunky-dory. I think sometimes when there are, there are those contradictions, it's because the EFF is trying to put the ANC, the ruling party in particular, under pressure to, make, to do the right thing. But you're right in saying that in the course of them doing that, they do make mistakes where they every now and then contradict themselves. They become constitutionalist on day one, and then on day two make con uh, proposals, for instance, that go against the very same constitution. Uh, I think it has also to do with the fact that uh, it's part of electioneering, you know, uh, elections around the corner. Uh, sometimes people, because we call it the silly season, politici politicians would make outrageous statements about a number of issues because they're trying to get votes. But which do you think is, is, is what he really wants? Uh, well, I, I, when we speak informally uh, with our colleagues from the EFF, you see uh, people who are committed to building a constitutional democracy. Right? Really? Yeah, no, they are. Uh, for instance, I don't think they would have taken President Zuma on the Gandla matter to the Constitutional Court if they didn't believe in us building a, a constitutional But you could democracy. argue that that was just opportunism because it hurts Zuma and that helps them. 
fair enough, fair enough for politicians. We'll have to identify opportunities sure. that we can use and try in order to try and bolster our campaign as political parties. But overall, this, uh, there, there must be a more medium to, medium to long-term strategy on these issues to say, once Jacob President Zuma is out of the picture, what kind of South Africa do you want to build? That's a question you always talk about. And then we say, that yes, we are making mistakes in the process of trying to get rid of President Zuma, but we need to self-correct in the process. So, uh, yeah, well, I, I think we're going to uh, uh, come back after the break, and what we want to talk about is what happens after these elections, because we're in a very uncertain period. Arguably, if the ANC is weakened in the cities, that doesn't necessarily hurt Jacob Zuma because he's built his base in the ANC, mm. in the countryside. But all of that when we come back. And we're back. On Jacob Zuma's watch, the ANC has de decayed morally. Uh, there's also been an increasing division in, in the tripartite alliance. Kasatu is much weaker. It's had a split off of its biggest union, NUMSA. Uh, the South African Communist Party is increasingly at odds. What happens after the election? Uh, can the ANC hold itself together? As a political party that is in competition with the ANC, we hope they don't hold itself. They don't hold themselves. Sure. Uh, but for the interest of the country, obviously, you hope that they are going to do the right thing and get rid of the person who's actually creating the problems for the ANC currently. Uh, right? The, they start from the top. He's failing to provide proper leadership. President, you know, we mustn't mince our words in so far as that is concerned. And one is hoping that after the elections they are going to, to wake up and smell the coffee, get rid of President Zuma so that we can begin the process of rebuilding uh, the image of South Africa. For instance, under the very same uh, President Zuma, under his watch, they have turned parliament into an institution that, uh, that no longer holds the executive accountable. The constitutional court judgment is clear on that. Uh, I've even said uh, they've turned parliament into an institution. They've used it to a contrarian aims. They've subverted all the checks and balances that are supposed to be in place and that are supposed to make sure that the ex executive is held accountable. So it's not only the executive in terms of cabinet and how they do things where they, they break every law, every piece of legislation with impunity, but they've also undermined parliament. It's also the very same African National Congress that you find undermining the office of the public protector. So for them, President Zuma is doing exactly what he said he would do last year. The declaration that he made that the ANC is actually more, more important than the country. You've seen that in their conduct. So it means that the only way they can self-correct is by removing those people who are failing to provide leadership in the party. Well, a key part of the problem is, is appointing someone as speaker who's also the chairperson of the, par of the party. Yes. I mean, for Baleka Mbete, as, as national chairperson of the ANC, her mandate is to advance her party against all others. But as Speaker in Parliament, her mandate is to be fair to all parties equally. Correct. Well, that's an impossible uh, conflict of interest. You're right. And, and we've raised that, uh, that, uh, that matter with the African National Congress in Parliament. But they don't care? They don't care because they have a simple majority. They can just outvote you in any decision on any motion. Do, that do they engage with that argument or they, do they just simply say, well, it's our decision? No, they don't really engage in the, with that argument substantively. That's to say that the Constitution allows us to put a political deployee as a Speaker of the National Assembly. If you have a problem with it, amend the Constitution. They are not looking at the other integrities mm -hmm. that make it difficult for Parliament to function properly. It really does weaken the Constitution. It does. And if you look at it, it's, it's, the, it's the problem that we find ourselves in when it comes to dealing with the EFF. She deals with the EFF in many instances as a political opponent of the African yes, National absolutely. Congress rather than a political party that is represented. She makes Congress. constant uh, uh, rulings that are, un that are, are un uh, inappropriate. That's correct. Now, of course, they had a, a, a first-rate speaker, I thought, in Max Sisulu. Yes, they And did. he was very balanced. He mm -hmm. part of the Sisulu family, mm -hmm. uh, very typical of the Sisulu family, much mm -hmm. admired and a fair man. And, of course, they, uh, they pushed him aside. They did. 
And, and remember, uh, he was an example, a clear example that impartiality is not synonymous with non-alignment. A person can still be aligned to a certain extent with a particular political party. But if you know that you have a professional uh, role to play and a professional duty to do, you respect that over your alignment to the ruling party. I mean, um, former Speaker Maxi Sul was even respected by the ANC because he was able to call them to order. In yes. fact, there were instances when I yes. just joined Parliament in 2013 where he would call the ANC to order more than he did, uh, you know, the, the opposition parties. Now, um, um, so after August 3rd, when the, when the, when the ch chips have fallen where they may and everyone's picking up the pieces, if... Cyril Ramaphosa does become president, and I mean, I must say things have changed because yes. uh, a few months ago, Jacob Zuma looked very weak, uh, but he's reorganized himself and he's, he's, he's uh, flexed his muscles and he's looking a lot stronger now. Mm -hmm. But even if Ramaphosa came in, won't your colleagues in the EFF turn on him immediately over Marikana and make it impossible for him to function in parliament? It, on, on the same basis? Well, it would be difficult to comment on the political strategy of the EFF post the pre President Zuma era. Uh, but to answer your question, I think there's a likelihood that, of that happening. But I think it, it can't happen to the same extent that it's happening under President Zuma. You know, we, I, I usually, when I chat informally with my friends, call him the chief campaigner for the opposition, because yes. that's what he does. Yes. He, he scores enough own goals for us. He gives us enough campaign material. In fact, Zuma does. Yes, he does. Of course. Enough campaign material to last us until 2050, in fact. Uh, you won't find, I don't think you can find that under um, uh, uh, Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa. There might be a few instances where you might disagree with what happened in Marikana and his conduct there. But in so far as his leadership is concerned, I think he will be able to, to bring even those people who are hardliners, perceived as hardliners, on board on some of the issues. My last uh, political um, analysis question for you. Do you think he is the most likely uh, follower to, to Zuma, or do you think others have, are more powerful? Uh, well, the ANC is, is a very difficult uh, party to, to... You can't predict whatever happens in the African National Congress. Uh, it seems, but the irony of it all is that the very same person who was crying foul during the period, the pe President Becky period, where he said that it's always been the tradition of the ANC to have the deputy president ascend to the presidency of the party. Now that man has turned around to say yes. we don't want Cyril, we want someone else in this campaign, doing exactly what President Becky did to him at the expense of the ruling party. The other disappointing thing is one would have thought that, uh, uh, I know you're in Nguni, but uh, after so many Nguni leaders, either Zulu or Koza, uh, of, the, of the ANC, you would have thought that they'd want a northerner uh, right. in the tradition of the old ANC, and I know you were in the ANC yourself. Mm -hmm. it, actually, it would make sense because then that way you, you create an environment where you make it, uh, you, you demonstrate to the South African public that uh, there's a full opportunity for all people of this country who have the best interests of the country at heart to lead the nation in yeah. instances where they are the best candidate for that position. Thank you very much Thank and you thanks for your insights. Um, before we go, uh, as usual, I'm going to recommend a book. The book I'm recommending is Dark Money, The Hidden History of the Billionaires Behind the Rise of the Radical Right. It's by Jane Mayer, uh, uh, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and uh, works on The New Yorker. I just recently did a book tour of the States, and this was the most useful book I found. If, you want, if you're following the American election and you want to understand um, what caused the rise of Donald Trump, who's such an unorthodox character, this, this book explains it without talking about Trump, because it's really about how people took control of the Republican Party over the last generation, using enormous amounts of money to push it further and further right. And what you've really had is a result, re revolt of ordinary voters in America who supported the Republican Party, but realize it hasn't delivered what they thought it would. And so uh, that's my recommendation for the week, Dark Money. Read it, and um, uh, that's, that's all for us tonight. Good night, and happy reading.